Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, where we phone audio engineers and producers at home. And thanks to the pandemic lockdown, they answer. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Audio Technology Magazine ISO Booth. Today, I'm honoured to welcome two members of Australian music royalty, uh, one arguably with more genuine claims to royalty than the other, but both household names, uh, Mr. Paul Kelly and Mr. Paul Grabowski. Welcome, guys, to the ISO Booth. Thank you very much for having us. Great to be here. Uh, the reason for both of you squeezing into the ISO booth today is due to the imminent release of a collaborative album called Please Leave Your Light On, uh, due out the end of July. Um, well done. Congrats. Thank you. Um, so I thought, um, as, as I've uh, warned you, Audio Technology likes to, I guess, dive straight into, I guess, the, the tech and the, um, I guess, the production kind of um, aesthetic of of a recording. So um, could I uh, get you both to perhaps reflect on sort of the sound and the, um, yeah, the sort of the production that you're after in, in this particular album? I'm not sure who wants to kick off. Hey, what if I start off first PG and then, and then you can talk a bit about the studio, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we, we definitely had a, a strong aesthetic for, for the record, which is, a turn your lamp down low record, intimate. We chose songs um, that would would maintain a concentrated mood. We, we weren't thinking to put in upbeat songs and or put a balance of uh, you know lighthearted song. We we wanted to 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 have a really uh, a mood that that drew the list in um, so, songs of you know heartbreak, um, regret, yearning, undying love. So uh, that that was that was it. that was uh, our sort of frame, yep. and we um, knowing that the record was just piano and voice, we knew we had um, this opportunity to, to create um, this beautiful space and, and this this world that the listener could dive into. Um, and Paul suggested that we do this record at. Monash University, the studio there, the David Lee studio, mm -hmm. and um, Paul can talk more about why why we thought this studio would be so good. Mm. Sure. Okay, so the studio um, is actually it, it's called the Sound Gallery, the David Lee Sound Gallery, and it's a room in a larger complex called the Ian Potter Centre for Performing Arts at Monash University, which is uh, pretty much a brand new building although it's it's built around a theater called the alexander theater which was uh, a foundation building of the original clayton campus mm. of monash university so for people who know where that is it's kind of in the melbourne southeast um and, and you know the university was built in the 1960s when that was really the extreme edge of melbourne in mm. those days and now you know, notionally, it's kind of the geographical centre of Melbourne, so a lot has changed. Um, the interesting thing about the David Lee Sound Gallery um, is that it contains uh, a piece of equipment, well, maybe that's underselling it really, um, an extraordinary thing called the Maya uh, Audio Constellation System. So uh, I'm sure your uh, listeners will be familiar with Maya Sound, from Oakland, California, they they make uh, line arrays, PA systems, um, you know, all manner of audio gear, very high quality, um, you know, and they have a great reputation. The Constellation system is really something quite unusual and unique. It is um, basically a series of microphones and loudspeakers which are distributed throughout the room um, and uh, directed into a very large series of like a whole rack of computers, um, which is called the Dimitri system. And um, what the system does is allows you as a performer or uh, as a producer to model the acoustic in the room according to what you want it to be. So although that 
sounds in effect like you know a glorified reverb unit it is so much more than that um yep. you know you can adjust the uh the various uh response rates of the different wall surfaces um down to very very precise measurements mm. um when the Maya engineers come in and tune the system that's a highly secretive process um, in the in the first stage and then once they've kind of got it set up uh, we come in and um, basically work with the engineers to create a, a series of different states mm, sure. um, and the whole thing is then operated basically from an eye uh, like a like a tablet mm. um, and you know the quality is amazing um, so really it, it enables you to go from completely dry and when i say completely dry the way that the room is designed if you, you switch the system off it really does sound as if all the air has been sucked out of the room mm. it's almost an anechoic chamber mm. in fact can I, just chime, can I just chime in there for a minute i was amazed when we first walked into the room and um the ben, ben engineer was, was yeah, ben just, Rose, yeah with his little ipad uh we just you know hit a button and like you know, one minute you're, gonna, you're hearing the room, and then this is just totally like. <laughs> and you do it, and then he showed us other sort of other settings, you know, where where your voice, a uh, voice sounded different. We're just sta standing there talking. It's not even with a mic, and the room is sounding completely different. Yeah, so it's kind of terrifying when it's switched off. It's, um, it's a, a very strange psychoacoustic experience. Yeah. I remember that vividly. But also, Paul, uh, Paul G. What? Why were they? What? Why is it so secretive when they come in to do? Well, this? you know, that's a very good question, and I, I just think it's a little bit about protecting, you know, your, your trade secrets and your IP. And I think when when people build these kinds of of um, very very high end sort of performance uh, systems, you know, they're very proprietorial about. What that is, and um, I kind of get that. You know, I, I've had the opportunity to speak to John Meyer a, a number of times, actually, about you know the system, and you know what what did he intend? Because when they originally built this system, they spent years he and, and his team going around the world's great concert halls, mm. analysing the acoustic spectra of the rooms. Mm. And then they worked with uh, actually a New Zealander developed the the kind of algorithm which forms the basis of this. Um, but, you know, they really did want to be able to create a system which allowed you to effectively imagine that you were in one of those rooms, although you know, the, the range of possibilities really does go from, as we described, from zero to the kind of Janol and caves or something mm -hmm. everything in between. So tell me about your presets, PG. Like, uh, have you got Carnegie Hall in there? Like, what, what have you got? Well, no, we, we think of it in terms of performance situations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did a setting for, like, solo piano, mm -hmm. uh, a setting for string quartet. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big room, this room, so it's, it would seat about 130 people. Mm -hmm. Um, proportionately, it's about a pro yeah, it's about the same size as the salon at the Melbourne Recital Centre. It's that kind of room, yep. and it's it's very beautiful. It's um, all of the wall surfaces are covered in discs, which are slightly bevelled, mm -hmm. sort of slightly angled discs. It's hard to see that when you first walk in, but they are all slightly at an angle, mm -hmm. like down the middle. Mm -hmm. And they act as, uh, they have an acoustical property to them as well. Um, but, yeah, they almost look like wine barrels. In fact, I refer to it, to it as the barrel room. Um. <laughs> and I've, I've uh, you know, I'm familiar with Constellation and I'm familiar with it being used as uh, to, um, uh, I guess, sort of modify the acoustic of a, of a space, um, especially in performance venues. But for it to be used um, as a recording space, uh, in a mix, I guess, of, of, you know, giving yourself the optimal kind of acoustic as a word for a recording space. That's not something I've really spent much time thinking about, but that's that's interesting. Well, it is interesting because, you know, you've got to look 
forward to to what we can expect to do in the future. And I mean, a lot of the of the recording studios I've worked in in my life have been rather um, undistinguished rooms, very very dependent on the skill of engineers mm. to you know make things sound good. Mm. Um, and you know, in the Alexander Theatre, for in the same building that I was talking about before, which is like a 570 seat uh, proscenium arch theatre, we've got three constellation systems. So one for the auditorium, one for the pit, right. and one which acts as a virtual uh, sort of sound uh, shell, which enables a larger ensemble if they're on stage to be able to hear each other really, really well. And soon after we finished that room, uh, the Branford Marsalis Quartet happened to be in Melbourne, and Branford rang me and said, uh, we want to record while we're here. Would you recommend a recording studio? And, you know, the places that the initially, the places that I thought of, like the ABC or you know, various places, but none of them were available. And then I thought, wait a minute, why, why doesn't he come to the Alexander Theatre? So they did. And um, they brought a, um, you know, Earn Rose's uh, remote studio. Sure. The UB, the... Um, the big OB truck. Well, yeah, the OB truck. And, uh, you know, they put a few baffles up and... Uh, we've got, you know, a fantastic piano in there, a beautiful Steinway D. And, you know, they had a fantastic time. And he did, I, I, I was careful not to make too much about the Constellation system because mm. I know that when musicians know that they're in a space which is already being mediated mm. by some kind of technological thing, mm. that doesn't appeal, mm. you know, as a first response doesn't appeal to some people, particularly mm. classical musicians mm. are a bit suspicious of that. Yeah. And, you know, people who play acoustic instruments, like in jazz groups, maybe also. Mm. But the thing is that the quality of the sound is just absolutely incredible. Mm. And so for what Paul was just talking about, the intimacy that we were trying to go for mm. in the album, you know, we were able to set the room, I would say, to perfection for exactly what we were looking for. So if you closed your eyes, you could imagine that you were in like the Capitol Studios in 1959 or Columbia's 130 Street studio, you know, where Miles recorded Kind of Blue. It was, I think, an old church and, uh, you know, very high ceilings and they used to use curtains, mm. ceiling to floor curtains, heavy curtains to dampen mm. the reverb in those mm -hmm. rooms. But... Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so that's, you know, we were kind of lucky because we wanted to go for something which is part of a tradition, I think, mm -hmm. of making a certain kind of record. Yep. And, you know, really thinking about the fact that vinyl was the sort of its natural home too, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bit of a long-winded story. No, it's great. It's a great story. <laughs> I, I, I sort of knew that, you, that Monash had the constellation, but I wasn't quite sure um that's still really fascinating so th yeah thank you very much and the mics and uh, and the recording rig and everything was that something that you've got in that theater or do you have to kind of hire it hire it and get a producer in um no i think we had uh well ben grayson recorded it and i think he he's a piano player he brought the the mics um and I'm, I, I can't remember what we use as the as the vocal recording mic, Paul. Can you remember? <laughs> Asking the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the wrong guy too. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, ben, That's okay. Ben, 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 <laughs> ben, uh, ben should be in on this conversation. No, yeah, he yeah. should be. We'll just have well, a look at the uh, music video. A fairly standard mic, is it the 58? Yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, he used a couple. He used more than one mic on you. Because he, he also used a mic to capture the room sound. That's um, right. And he used, I think he used three mics on the piano. I think one underneath it and two across it. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Yeah. But and uh, so I guess I, I, you you've obviously feel like you've nailed that aesthetic and, um, uh, and, and it's, it's probably a bit of a template for... Um, people recording in that way in future. Like, I'm sure you're not necessarily the first to record in a constellation room. I'm sure, you know, concert, um, I'm sure symphony orchestras have probably been recorded in 
concert halls with constellation involved but this is the first time i've I've heard of constellation used in this way, but um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Hmm. Well, well, it's the first just... time in my life that I've been interesting in a, in any technical sense. So <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll say that go. that's a must. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Paul. but uh, yeah, it was it was a real it was a, it's a very easy room to work in. So it made the experience very joyful. Mm. Um, you know, it didn't need monitors or yeah. headphones so just we just set up set up next you know a little distant from each other I'd hear that the piano Bob would hear me and and uh very and yeah very comfortable and natural know. yeah yeah we just cut, played the tunes down till they, they sounded right mm. so and the piano was Steinway C I can say that yeah. I, I know about the pianos <laughs> I bought those pianos for the university, so <laughs> You're I, I took involved. full responsibility for them. Yeah. How much uh, does a Steinway cost? A Steinway C. Oh, a lot. Is it is it more than two hundred grand? Yeah, the C is around two hundred grand, right. and the D is like two fifty. Yeah, okay. Just uh, you know, sort of a COVID impulse purchase. My, um, you know, my fingers hovering over the eBay button. <laughs> 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 Good luck with that. <laughs> um, so while I've got you both, um, I'd love to have the opportunity just to sort of go um, get into the DeLorean and go back um, in time and um, uh, take you back to, I guess, some of the earliest, um, I guess, memories of, of hitting the recording studio, where that was, who was with, who was involved, like, and I guess your response to it, like whether you've... Um, you know, were struck by the possibilities or was it daunting or was it kind of chaotic? Like, um, yeah, maybe PK, do you want to, have you got any reflections on sort of when you first darkened the door of a studio in a, in a seedy back alley in Collingwood in 1975? Uh, well, I, I certainly do, um, but uh, I'm probably not good with details, but I, sure. I certainly can remember the feelings. Mm. I found studios, you know, quite daunting and, uh, and, scary at first um i think one of my first recordings was at the big uh, at the uh big abc studio in in, in ripponley uh, doing something for some show probably around uh 77 78 i first came to melbourne in in, in 77 mm -hmm. um but my then one of my then a, a recorded ep um at richmond recorders this was then called in, in Richmond, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which became Sing Sing. Right. Um, and then, you know, various places after that. But it took me a long, long time to feel uh, relaxed in the studio. Also, back, in then, back then in the late 70s and then continuing into the 80s, um, uh, studios were expensive. Um, um, and uh, so... Time was always limited. I always been felt, remember being very aware of the clock and having to get it get it right in the in a short amount of time and um, and not you know not getting it right <laughs> and re really struggling. Um, it st struggled into the into the eighties as, as well a bit with um, uh, uh, as. Um, the whole aesthetic of recording became very much about um, playing to a click track, yeah. uh, you know, layering things on one 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 piece at a time. Mm. I I absolutely hated hated that, um, and I, I I you know I I felt that it was would suck suck the life out of recordings. Mm. So I. I I did a record in 1984, where, which was um, um, just an acoustic record with with uh, me, Steve Connolly, and, and, and Michael Barclay, and we did it at Clive Shakespeare's house in in uh, in Sydney, in uh, his basement, just a home studio, mm. and um, that's you know, that was that was a really um, Great experience, and probably the first time I felt, you know, uh, I think it was also the timing of uh, finding finding my own 
voice in terms of my writing and and so on. So a few things were were were, were coming together at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was this, I, I, I by that stage I'd made two records and hadn't hadn't done very well, and I was out of contract, and I paid for that record myself, mm-hmm. and it cost three and a half thousand dollars. I remember that was a lot of money. I had to borrow it, yeah. and. Um, uh, so again, it was time constraint. We had mm. we had a week, um, yeah, right. but it was like it. about a thousand dollars a day in the eighties, I guess, to get an SSL studio. It was expensive, and and it's really interesting. Like the um, the power imbalance was so kind of in favor of the studio, even like with you know well known artists. Like you know, you could have some kind of middling engineer kind of bossing, you know relatively famous musicians around say hey you know we're up against the clock and you know here's the click you know you need to play like this and it's all very kind of prescriptive wasn't it yeah there, there was a bit of that um you know i certainly remember you know there was seemed to be a period where the, the engineers were like little kings and uh you know you go into the studio and and they would spend most of the first day you know the engineer would be dialing up his tremendous drum sound <laughs> All the rest of the band is waiting around. Meanwhile, the, the life is getting sucked out of everybody. That's right, yeah. uh, but uh, I you know, quickly realised I don't want to record like that. So I, I became someone who, who who wanted to wanted wanted to record quickly mm. and rehearse rehearse a lot before going in, and then know what we're doing in the studio and record quickly. So I started working with the messengers and the records are made from the mid mid eighties. Um, with them uh, over six years, we we were, you know, we worked pretty fast, and we worked a lot with an engineer called Alan Thorne, who was also great yeah, in that way. Um, we were still there were still certain still there were certain eighties uh, elements in those recordings. You couldn't escape it. I mean, I, I still listen to the drum sound of um, To Her Door or Dumb Things, and you know, and hear that. that the, the big reverb and think, oh, you know, we could probably could have had a bit less reverb on. <laughs> but and also, you know, we 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 sometimes did click click tracks, um, it, just to, to to get it, you know, to you know, uh, uh, just that was sort of the the way that people did things. Mm. Um, and I'm a pretty steady rhythm guitar player, so I, I never had much much of a problem playing to clicks. But we we didn't do that for too long, and we started as we felt more comfortable. We just we just played the song. And then, ever since then, uh, yeah, I've never really used clicks unless it's a specific type of song or recording that you're going for. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, and fast forwarding to now, so, so over the last ten years, um, I've worked a lot with an engineer called Stephen Stephen Schramm, who is um, he's got sort of the op- he's got the opposite of that eighties aesthetic. He's an engineer that loves mistakes. He, he just loves the performance. Mm-hmm. He's all about capturing the performance and um, he's very, you know, he'll, uh, he, he dials up the sound very quickly as we're, we're playing and as, what, what we can hear as we play. Mm-hmm. I get together with my band now, there's five of us uh, and we, we've done a lot of recording in a place called Sound Park. Yep. In Melbourne, which is a rehearsal studio, rehearsal rooms as well, mm-hmm. and we set up, we set up and play live. I sing uh, and I sing live. Mm-hmm. Um, so people often ask me, now, have you got any stems for that for that track, or you've you got that? Have you got a mix of that song without the vocals?" I said, "Sorry, it's, it's everything spilling." B. Shram loves spill, so yep. we we just go with it and we just play the song till we get a good performance. And her, as well as being a great engineer, he's a good judge of when. You know, you always need that outside ear. He's a good judge. Have you guys got one? I think you can keep going. You're going to do better. Or he might say, you, need, you guys need a break. Well, let's get that. Maybe that first take was the one. Yep. So we'll two songs. Sometimes it's take 20. Sometimes it's take one. But mm. he's got those, those ears for that. Mm. Um, so, but I have to say, you know, it did take a long time for me to get confident enough as a singer and as a, as a performer mm. to be able to just record live in the studio. Um, so that and that, you know that continued on with the record with PG here, yeah, you know, yeah, to yeah. light the studio record, That's which right. is the way I like to work now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, so PG, um, what's your reflections on early? Yeah, early well, my my story is a bit different from Paul's because Paul came up, um, you know, as he just said, recording in bands, which were uh, touring bands, and um, you know 
was very much uh, a particular genre of music which had its own, I think, probably its own protocols um, in the studio. And he was absolutely right um, in terms of my memories about the 80s. Uh, you know, everything was layered. You know, the click was king, gated snare. I mean, I just remember, you know, tears for fears, Tom's sound was supposed to be the gold standard. Of, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. So, I, you know, I could care less about any of that stuff. But um, I, I did... Uh, do, I used to write a lot of music for film and television. Yes. So uh, some of my earliest studio experiences um, were really about that. <laughs> and, you know, I came in on the tail, just at the, the tail end of the sort of completely analog era yep. and the beginning of digital. Um, and just what I remember is, is waiting, waiting, waiting for tape machines to sync up with video machines. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, they used to use something called Q-Lock, okay. which, you know, these, and, and it was such a kind of dark art. You know, you'd have to enter in these offsets. And I worked with, you know, um, engineers like John French and um, Ian Mack and McKenzie and uh, Robin Gray. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, who really knew this stuff. They, they understood, you know, the technology such as it was. But, oh, you, you'd have to buy, like, you know, endless reels of Ampex, four, five, six. I mean, you know, because every reel held about, I forget how much exactly, but it was like 17 minutes of music yep. or yep. something like that. Yeah. And, you know, for a film score, you, you might need 20 of them, mm. you know. Mm. And again, yes, that was a very expensive exercise because you'd be uh, there'd be an orchestra in the studio, or at the very least, mm. you know, a number of musicians. So you would play to the movie. Yeah, well, yeah, we'd play to the movie. I mean, everything was written to clicks, and the clicks uh, were dependent on on the film. Mm. I mean, not every director liked to work that way. Uh, I did a lot of music with a director called Paul Cox, who hated the whole idea of you know, syncing music, like mm. that the music had to be in lockstep with pictures. So mm. he virtually never did that. Yep. And he would just say, you know, I like, you know, I like that that tune or, you know, write more yeah. like of mm. that stuff. Just give it to me and I'll fly it in wherever I think it works, yep. which, you know, is a is fantastic. It's a very auteur kind of way to work um, and certainly isn't the norm. Mm. Uh, but, you know, in those days, um, yeah, it was a pretty steep learning curve uh, from, a, from a technical point of view. Um, and, you know, it goes without saying MIDI changed everything when, when it came in. Uh, not that I had been very involved with, with film before MIDI, but, you know, MIDI basically changed the way that, well, it changed the way that musical instruments were designed, but it also changed the way that... that protocols in the studio were followed too. Um, but then there's the other side of what I do, which is, you know, because I basically come from jazz music, that, that's where Paul's experience and mine are quite similar. You know, um, our whole thing in jazz is to capture the performance. And uh, there's very little kind of pre or post production on most of that sort of music. I mean, it's really difficult to edit jazz because it's never, you know, no two takes are ever the same. I mean, people do it, but often you can hear the edit points where sure. where they're edited, and particularly if they've been edited on tape, kind of, you know, if, you, if you're listening through a good pair of headphones, you can hear where the edits take place. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit hard with, with jazz because it felt like even, like, um, the recording... Um, the aesthetic of the recordings sort of almost hit their zenith in like the early 60s or late 50s. Well, they did. And, and they so did. They I mean, engineers like Rudy Van Gelder or, um, you know, uh, who sort of made the blue note sound, that's what we associate with. Or I mentioned kind of blue earlier, you know, beautifully recorded performances, you know, recorded on the absolute analog gear, I mean, sometimes just stereo or earlier than that mono and then maybe four track and so on. I mean, it kind of hit bottom in the sort of late 70s. Jazz records started to sound pretty awful. Uh, 
often the the you know the basses were heavily relied on the di sound um so there was a sort of you know sense that acoustic basses were sounding like electric bass but not really like good electric bass yep. and then that all started to turn around again in the 80s and uh you know it was capturing the actual sound mm. using microphones mm. and less reliant on mm. on uh, you know but compression process i'm not sure about you but when i hear uh, a jazz um recording that almost sounds too pristine and like in a you know sort of like a a, a concert hall setting or something that's got all the space i just i just kind of want to go back to you know rudy's studio in jersey and just sort of hear that sound you know yeah that's the sound i want to hear and, and no, i get else, it yeah. Yeah. i get it i mean you know ecm created a sound manfred Eicher created a sound which is what you are describing in in the sense of you know, very specific reverbs and more space in the music mm. and that's an aesthetic which you know has proven to be extraordinarily successful mm. but it is um you know light years away in in its intention also from what you know hackensack what, Ru what rudy van gelder was doing mm. and i mean i like both of those things mm. but um you know the best engineer really uh, or the, the two of the best engineers i've worked with jazz wise one of them would be robin gray um, with whom I worked, as I mentioned, on lots of films. And the other, I've done a lot of work with Ross Cockle and, and he, you know, really has a, a good feel for that music as well. Mm. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, there are a generation of, of um, guys uh, and pe people, men and women now, who are players and they know how to record. Mm. So, you know, they're coming to it with musicians' ears. They know what the music is is experientially and they're able then to you know employ that knowledge as recording engineers somebody like phil noy is a very good example of that mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a really good engineer um a lot of you know nico schaubler is another one he's got pug house studio in thornbury mm -hmm. i mean nico's a great musician great composer an amazing drummer really great recording engineer so mm -hmm. You know, I think there's more of that kind of thing going on now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, I'm going to not be too selfish and uh, and uh, hold on to you too much longer. And I, um, uh, I thank you both for your reflections. Um, um, Just can I jump in quickly with a, a quick question for me? Yeah. Um, that the soundtrack for Last Orders, which I love. Can you? How did you do that? Can you talk a bit about that? Last Orders was a film uh, directed by Fred Skepsey and uh, with an all-English cast based on a novel by Graham Swift. And um, it's about uh, a group of men who uh, take their buddy's ashes um, to throw the ashes, scatter the ashes off the pier uh, I think in Bournemouth or somewhere on, on the English Margate. coast. Margate? It's on Margate. Yeah, it could be Margate. And uh, in that journey, it's a kind of a, in a way, um, it's it's an exploration of recent British history, and taking in the, the war and, you know, the hardships and the austerity and the struggles of working people, and, and but also friendship and what friendship means and relationships that they've had. Mm. Yeah, it's a really beautiful film. A and the music um, had a very small group. So I scored it for um, like violin, cello, pedal steel, guitar, piano, double bass, uh, drums on some tracks and a couple of horns, trumpet. Guy Barker played the trumpet, I remember. A uh, wonderful trombonist called Mark Nightingale. And uh, so, yeah, recorded at Airedale yeah, Studios. The bass clarinet. Oh, the bass clarinet, which oh. is the sort of feature instrument. That's <laughs> right. A great uh, bass clarinetist whose name escapes me now. But, uh, yeah, the first sound you hear, actually, uh, on the soundtrack, first you hear the pedal steel guitar and then you hear the bass clarinet. And, boy, is that a beautiful sound, mm -hmm. really beautiful sound. In the hands of a good player, there's nothing like a bass clarinet. Mm. 
because it has such a range. You know, it's got a really and it's got a really interesting and kind of haunting upper register. Yep. But the the mids and the lows are just they're so sweet and rich. So anyway, yeah, uh, we did it uh, in a couple of days. I think we were in the studio for maybe three days of recording or maybe not even, it's like two days of recording and two of mixing. Um, I had, uh, everything was to click. Um, with Fred, you know, Fred, he's very particular about what he wants. I wrote the score in New York uh, where he was editing the movie. Um, so I set up a little studio right next to the cutting room and as they went through various versions of the movie, the, the music changed. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you like uh, sketch out, you know, those, those kind of arrangements? You, you just sort of write all the parts on the piano and just punch it into a, a program like Sibelius or whatever or how, do you, how would you do it? No, I used a program called Digital Performer and um, I, I'd play in basically all the parts. Because I was writing for a small ensemble, it was really quite, a, you know, that, that was straightforward. Mm. But I like to hear everything that's going on. Mm. It's, and so does the director. They like to know what they're more or less going to get. Right. And they also like to have music of yours rather than using dreaded temp music, mm. which is, you know, a composer's worst nightmare in a way. <laughs> when they've already fallen in love with their temp score and, you know, I'm not John Williams, I'm sorry, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the music budget is one one hundredth of the music budget on that movie. <laughs> so, but Fred and I are very good, you know, very close friends and, um, yeah, so we, we started out wanting to write something quirky um, but over the over the various iterations of the film, it became less quirky and far more, um, I think, tender. Really, would be the word. Mm. Yeah, it's very emotional. It's a very, a very emotional. Yeah, it's, it's tender. The music works with the, the film. Is, is, is yeah, really special. Oh, that's that. I'm so pleased you like that, Paul. It's yeah, I, I love that score too. I think it's you know, one of the best that I ever did. And I'll tell you what the, the difficult thing was with that score was that f until then, Fred had worked on several projects with the great American film composer Jerry Goldsmith, mm. you know, who yeah. famously wrote Planet of the Apes and... Big boots. You know, yeah, I mean, he was amazing. And uh, I got to play piano on a couple of the scores that he recorded in Australia for Fred. Mm. And I got to know Jerry, and uh, I mean, wow, you know, he was quite a guy. Um, but he got ill and was uh, unavailable for, for last orders, which he otherwise would have done for sure. And Fred kind of gave me the Guernsey. Um, so, you know, I was very, very aware that yeah, big boots, absolutely. So, you know, I, I had to... Um, I had to say to Fred, look, you know, what you're going to get from me is is going to be very different from Jerry. You know, Jerry thinks big and, you know, he's a, he's a real master of a craft which he's learned from other masters. Mm. You know, his kind of mentor was Bernard Herrmann. Mm. So there's incredible kind of pedigree. Yeah. And I'm coming at these things from a very different point of view. But we, we did have a really great time and I think that we grew together. That's the thing is that um, I learned to trim my sails and triangulate the thread and not to hang on to uh, the meaning of a piece of music as if it was super important. You know, I think as a film composer you have to learn to relinquish. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I remember we did one t uh, test screening. We... Uh, we um, threw up all this music that I'd written and went and played it in, you know, some multiplex somewhere out in God knows where, in the, in the outer suburbs of New York City. And I'm sitting there watching this. And, I'm, okay, I mean, it was all daggy MIDI sounds and stuff, but actually I'm thinking, shit, that music is so wrong. It is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I'm, I'm going to rewrite this pretty much root and branch. Mm -hmm. 
So I went in on a Sunday when no one was around. And basically that's when all the material which became the score came to me. And it's, as Paul will know from, you know, the mysteries of songwriting, how these things happen mm. is mysterious. Sure. But somehow you've got to go through, dredge up and get rid of a whole lot of things that you think, mm. you know, are clever, oh, this will be terrific, how could they possibly not like this? I'm so something, you know, and all you've got to kind of really just flush that sure. to find out what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And the score that I ended up writing is is surprising. I mean, I hear it and I go, wow, okay, I wrote that. Interesting. I wish I, wish I could write more music like that. That's, That's awesome. I like that. <laughs> That's a really good response. How, it, yeah. is, it, is it the most... Um, uh, I guess um, sort of exposed you've ever felt as as a musician or a composer, you know, when you're hearing your music uh, to picture in a theatre, um, is is that quite sort of confronting as a composer? Um, look, by the time you've you've sat in an editing suite and listened to the music a billion times and in the process of writing it also, mm. you're kind of so sick of it by, by the end of it yeah. that the idea of having to sit even through the premiere of movies, which I have done, yeah. and, you know, Last Orders famously uh, premiered on the 8th of September in the year 2001 okay. yeah. in Toronto. Um, you know, after which we were all in lockdown of a very different kind mm -hmm. uh, yeah, at the wow. Toronto Film Festival. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it takes me a really long time. I mean, like it might be years before I then can watch a movie and go, oh, right, I remember, I, yeah. And you go, oh, actually, that, that's nice music, you know. <laughs> I don't mind that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, well, uh, PK, unless you've got any more questions for PG, um, <laughs> wind up there. <laughs> but thank you so much. We'll have to save it for our, you know, our podcast. That's you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can just, you know, pick up on, just, just to finish, you know, finish up, pick up on what he said. We, all we ever want to do is just surprise ourselves, you know. That, that's, yeah. As writers, you, it's the thing that happens that takes you by surprise often that, that, yeah. that uh, get you to a song and then also in the studio um it's a bit of, it's always a dance with with paul um that's each take each take it it's different and we like we, we talked about that space before and we have to really lean into each other and reach across that that space so the record's a lot about trust mm. uh, yeah a big word for us trust that's a big word each other doing those yeah. songs and I think it's full of, you know, I think we were genuinely surprised and delighted by what came out of it. I mean, when I listen to it now, I just think, I honestly think what's not to like, you know, you put it on, you play through the tracks and it's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's like having a really wonderful and mm -hmm. not over elaborate meal where everything is carefully Mm. made mm. with a beautiful wine to accompany it mm. and you go wow well that, that felt pretty good mm. you know? so a uh, pre-order on vinyl i would suggest pardon me pre-order on vinyl i would suggest oh it's a great one for vinyl mm. awesome. great mm. for vinyl. yeah yeah you'll really be able to hear that it's a nice little crackle yeah well, it's it's yeah. Great. yeah thanks again paul much appreciated good luck